God, we ask that you'd be with us in these moments, that you would fill our hearts with your peace, that you'd bless us with your presence, that you'd enable us to hear and understand what it is that you'd have to speak to us here this morning. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If I'm very honest, I sometimes struggle with the question of whether faith has a greater capacity for saving the world or destroying the world. I see someone attack a clinic in Colorado Springs in the name of faith. I see others attack a holiday party in San Bernardino, again, in the name of faith. Last week, I spoke about joy, but sometimes, to be very honest, it's hard. Sometimes what I really feel is angry. When I see how easy it is for people to take a life, when I see how easy it is for people to destroy in the name of God, I get angry over it. And I also, on some level, that I don't really understand, I also want to apologize for it. Even if that person who has committed this act is not from my tribe, even if that person who has committed this act doesn't share the faith that I have, I feel some kind of responsibility toward it. I don't know exactly why, but I do. I think in part it's because I know that there are millions of people who are watching the TV and just looking at it and saying, see, I told you that religion was no good for us. I told you that faith only got people into trouble. This week, I don't know if you saw it or not, but it was kind of the front page of the, of the daily news about the idea of, should we really be praying after these tragedies? And the message essentially was whether you can you know, make it this simple or not, I'm not sure. But the message as I took it was, stop praying and start doing something. And I understand that to some degree. I get it that words are cheap. We say that all the time. But if words are cheap, then how can we also say <clears throat> that it was anti-abortion rhetoric that led to what happened in Colorado? If words are cheap, then how can we say that it's anti-police rhetoric that leads to the killing of officers? Are words really that cheap if they cost people their lives? I don't get that. Don't words matter? Now, as someone who finds worth, perhaps his major worth in his words, I mean, after all, isn't that what I'm paid to do? Isn't that what you all hire me to do? I have to believe that words do matter. But today's scripture is a time in history when words failed. That's the background that comes before this story about Zechariah. Words failed Zechariah. That's the reason why he has to write on a tablet what his son's name is going to be. So if we can go back a little further, Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. And he was a priest. He was serving in the temple. He was an older man, married to an older woman. The couple had no children, and they certainly had no reason to expect any children. But as Luke relates this story, one day when Zechariah was serving in the temple, he was met by an angel standing at the side of the altar. He was surprised to hear the angel saying to him a message that would change not only his life, but the lives of everyone who would come. He's told, you and your wife, you're going to have a baby. And this child is not going to be any ch child. This life is not going to be any life. But this will be the greatest servant to come before the greatest servant to come. He will be the one who will prepare the way and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Zechariah had been given the greatest news imaginable. 
for a couple, a childless couple, whether then or now, but even more so then, for a childless couple to learn that they're going to have a baby. That was everything. This was the greatest news he'd ever heard, and yet he found himself completely unable to share it. Words failed him. What the scripture says is because he was so surprised and shocked and disbelieving of what this angel had said, the angel said, you will no longer speak until this thing comes to pass. You will be silent. So Zechariah was quiet in the moment of his greatest triumph. He was unable to share what it was that he had learned. He could not believe that God could be this good. And the angel said, because you don't have the faith to believe it, you'll be quiet until it comes to pass. And so for nine months he said nothing. I feel this tension sometimes within myself that the coming of Jesus into our world is the greatest news imaginable. To use the words of Zechariah's song, after he is able to speak, after the baby is born, we have this mighty Savior, the one who brings salvation to his people and the forgiveness of sins. In him, dawn breaks upon us bring light into the lives of those who sit in the shadow of death. And all these things are true. And yet, our witness is too often like Zechariah's. Too often we are silent. We have a hard time proclaiming the good news. And that's true not just for us as individuals, but for us as the church. And I believe that part of the problem here is that's because, like Zechariah, we're not 100% sure that what it is that we have to say makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense for Zechariah and Elizabeth to have a child at their age. And when Zechariah hinted to that angel, how am I going to know that this is going to happen? That's when he was told, you know what? Because you don't believe, you will be silent. Well, it doesn't make any sense either for us to proclaim this Savior. The Savior promises us, on the one hand, says, you will be saved from your enemies and delivered from the hand of all those who hate you. Now, that sounds like something that we need right now, doesn't it? But there's more. In the same set of verses, this same Savior is described as the one who will lead our feet into the ways of peace. I want you to sit with that for a moment. To be saved from all those who hate us and to lead our feet into the ways of peace. That's not usually how we do things. That's not usually how it works. If we want to be saved from enemies, what do we do? We buy a gun. We drop a bomb. That makes a lot more sense to us. To be saved from enemies seems to us to be a totally different thing than to be led in the path of peace. We might actually say that being saved from enemies is much more a human thing than a God thing. That's how we perceive it. We defend ourselves in the face of a threat. But to be led in the path of peace, now that's something that seems otherworldly to us. That genuinely seems to be something from beyond what humans are capable of. Because it seems like, honestly, something only a fool could do. How could we possibly let down our guard? How could we possibly put down our arms? I do not have the answer to those questions. I very much wish that I did. But I do find in them a challenge for my own spirit. The kind of challenge that I believe very much comes from God. I also find in them definitive proof that Jesus is who the church says he is. That is fully human and fully divine. 
I will defend you from your enemies. I will lead you in the path of peace. Those things do not go together any more than being human and being divine do. I have a feeling we have a hard time proclaiming Jesus because we have a hard time believing Jesus. I also have a feeling that that's why this week at one of the largest Christian universities in the world, the president stood up and advised everybody on campus to begin carrying. What he said was, let's teach them a lesson before they show up here. I don't believe that being saved is the same thing as being safe. But during Advent, I feel called once again to study this mystery, and it is a mystery, to understand more deeply the Savior, to let his life be born once more in my life. Because according to the story, it's only after the child is born that Zechariah can begin to speak again. And maybe it's true that when Christ is again born in me, when I've embraced this mystery that can only be understood by faith, that maybe my own voice will be freed again. Maybe words will no longer fail me. And I'll be able to speak once more as Zechariah once spoke of the Savior who both promises that we'd be saved from the hands of our enemies and be led in the path of peace. This is something so much more than the world can understand. This is so much some, more than anything that the world has to offer. So much more than we can imagine receiving. This is a promise that cannot be understood one that can only be born in us this Advent. Amen.